Label was that man got together and decided they would create their own power. Now, the problem was that they didn't want to be from heaven, they wanted to come to show how important they were. And so they were cooperating, which is what people do usually. They cooperate. But the problem in their cooperation is they begin to build themselves up. And so God separated them by, by uh, using the language. Now, that worked for that. But then how do you communicate to people if they can't talk to each other, if they don't have the same common language that they talk with? That's always a difficult. I remember uh, one time I went to the one about And uh, so we had a picture. I'll never forget what happened today. I was going to the lesson, and the class was often puzzled. And I finally said, "There are problems. They forget. He not saying what you said. Not not all New English understand that it wasn't what I was what I they were portraying is not what I was trying to say. And so there was always this wall, and you have to have to break down the wall for that to happen. And that's what is happening in the, in our world." You don't have something common, you always have to And what you heard was the things that there's a very don't understand. Like it that you are most comfortable. And that's true because of a lot of reasons. But today we have a wealth, a wealth of ability and uh, language and Translations that help us understand our own language. My bookshelf, my physical bookshelf, has 24 different translations of the Bible. Now, if I add my computer Bible to that, that has more than 50. So probably somewhere around 100 to 120 translations of the Bible are available to me today. Are you aware, as we're going to go through this class, that that is a recent occurrence? That that was not always available to us. In fact, if you did not read Greek or Hebrew in the first two or three hundred years, it didn't do you any good. And some, some things were happening there. One was a scarcity, if you will, a, a scarcity of the text. Uh, but the biggest problem was that people said, we want the people to have the Bible in their language. But they had to pay with their lives to make that happen. That's how difficult what we have today is. So the first thing that happened was they didn't have a lot of it. We, we talk about this a lot. They had scrolls and they had parchments, but the problem is you don't pass those around very well. You don't have a lending library, for instance. You don't have it in your home. You can't just walk over to your shelf and pick it up. Today, one of the interesting things is we have it so available. I read my daily Bible uh, on my iPad. I can take it anywhere. It doesn't have to be on a shelf. I don't even have to have an internet connection. I got it downloaded. And so there was a time, though, you didn't have that the apparatus. <laughs> And because of that, you, you couldn't read it. You didn't have it. It was unavailable, and it might have taken thousands of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars even in our money to create that. There was Then they began to put it in these codexes, and so they began to become available in churches. Which is what the church did. And they were talking about those They had been translated into Latin by that time. Nobody knew Latin. Do you know Latin? When I was in high school, they taught Latin, some students. Now the nerdy kids took Latin because they want to make 1600 on their SAT. 
Some of them came close a lot better than I did, but nobody learns Latin. Nobody learned Latin in the myth, in the dark ages either. They talked to each other, but it wasn't in Latin. Latin was the language of the church. And so something was happening. Suddenly you have these barriers that are there to everything. And so if the Bible's kept under lock and key in an emotional sense. It's not that they put it in a vault everywhere. Instead, it became the property of the clergy. Why? They're the ones who learn Latin. They're the ones who had access to the copies. They're the ones who could read it and possess it and have it there. But the other part was you only heard it when you went to church. The term liturgy means the worship place. Um, and uh, so if you wanted to go, you had you hear the Bible, you could go to church. But here's the problem. When you went to church, they read it in Latin. You didn't know Latin. Now, isn't that a weird thing? We want to tell people the word of God, but we're not going to make it available in a way that you can understand what the word of God is. That's really strange. But that was not the problem. The problem was they wanted control. They wanted control of what you heard and did. And so you were you had to believe what you were told because you had no way of putting your finger on a verse that says, wait a minute. I don't see that here. Ron? They still do that, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. They'll start questioning you. Yes. That's right. That's right. When I when I was growing up, I I my elementary school across the street from a huge Roman Catholic cathedral, St. John's, and almost all of my friends were Roman Catholic in school, except for about three of us who were uh, we didn't speak either Spanish or Catholic. Let's put it that way. Um, and I remember that on Wednesday afternoons, right after school, they had catechism for the street. And these kids would go to catechism, and apparently they had a nun who could swing a ruler like Babe Ruth swung a bat. I can't tell. You can tell, listen to their stories. It was, she was fearsome, man. I didn't want to meet that, that nun in the, on a dark alley is what it sounded like. And apparently she said, you're going to learn this the way I teach it. And if you ask them, well, what does the Bible say? We don't read the Bible. We read the catechism. The way of controlling things when that happened. And up until uh, 50 years ago, that's, it remained that way. You went to a Catholic church, for instance, everything was in Latin. Now, i got to tell you something. You'll go tell my wife, so go tell her. She wishes we had new benches. You see, you know why? He's short. She wants to put her feet up and be comfortable. Her legs dangle like this the whole time. We get up from the invitation song, she buckles up and shakes her feet. Um, but that's the only thing about Catholicism she likes, is they have a place to put the feet. Not exactly religious, but very practical. I had yet to persuade an elder to it, so if you're going to go back to the community, just to let you know. But you had to believe what you were told. Up until you get to the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, a shift was taking place that was important that we don't think about, except we are the beneficiary of. A lot of times we think we enjoy, we know we realize where it came from. We meet a man named John Wycliffe. Wycliffe was a, he was a, a scholar who was kind of a firebrand rebel at the same time. He published the first English Bible in 1382. That's not even, well, 700 years ago. First time here in our life. That was what he was. He was English. He wanted, he wanted the people to read the Bible in their own language. What Wycliffe did was he took the Latin and translated the Latin into English. I want to talk about a copy of the copy of the copy that the Latin was 
stuff like that. But at least it was in their language. But you couldn't publish anything yet. You know why? You still had his pocket, if I could. And so not too many people read it, but it was available in underground copies. It was kind of circulated among those who wanted to really read it. Um, and even though it was translated from Latin, several things happened. Now, one thing, uh, let me go backwards here about Wycliffe. Wycliffe, um, he was condemned as a heretic. And he was burned at the stake for doing it. And then they took his actions and divided them into four parts and scattered them in four different parts of the earth because they figured that way he missed the resurrection. If you've got your body everywhere else, God doesn't know where to find it. Yeah. I still run up against that. When people ask me, what do you think about the Middle East? I think if God could put the dust in you, God could find the dust where you are. Uh, Nicholas, though, was, uh, he was succeeded by a man named William Tyndall, who was called the father of the Bible. Tyndall did great things. He studied under scholars named Erastus, who talked about it. Erastus and Tyndall took his father to come to the so, Douglas, you were listening to the original book. So, he put together the first English Bible that was from the original one to the Old Testament. In the middle of all of this, Henry VIII, thinking to what? And so he decided to form our own church. On the Church of England, he divorced himself to the Church of England. And it looks exactly like Catholicism, except they allowed him to get a divorce. And so, whatever of the problem with the Catholic Church, and they had a lot, freaking secularism, there was greed. You want to know how you built those cathedrals in Europe? Is you, is you took money from the people. I don't mean contributions, I mean you built them. Held them up if you had to. And so they built these great cathedrals, and the people were in it, and they were being forced into poverty. And so he criticized that in the Church of England. And by the he, he flees to, in 1536, he flees to Belgium, hoping that maybe uh, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, will give him uh, asylum. The problem is he's arrested in Belgium, where he is strangled, then burned, and pays with his life. He said, I would to God that the plowman would sing a text of scripture at his plow, the weaver at his womb with this would drive away the tediousness of time. I would that wayfaring men with his pastime would expel the weariness of his journey. He said, I want people to be able to read the Bible to know for themselves what God has to say. Isn't that a novel idea? Today we go, well, of course, the of course has taken 500 years to become reality. For most of Christian history, people have not had the blessing we have had to read the Bible. And so when he was strangled and burned, his last words were, Lord, open the eyes the king of England. That was his parting shot. It is said of him that he lighted such a candle by God's grace in England should never be put out. 
every Bible you and I read today in English. Everyone. It makes no difference if it's translated. Everyone goes back here. Whether it be a King James, a New Revised Standard, an English Standard, no matter what, it, it always goes back to, to the Tyndale. We have it because of it. And he died for it. Never treat the Bible as not something precious. People spill their blood to make sure you and I can read it. And then, in 1440, Gutenberg develops the printing press. Now you can publish. Now you can print hundreds of copies at once. And it's cheap and anybody can have them. It, we, we sometimes talk about... <clears throat> Inspiration as uh, as putting words on the page. I think inspiration is broader than that. As I told you, it's about uh, preservation as well. And I think part of the preservation comes here. It, it says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, that in the fullness of time, Jesus came forth, born of a woman, born under the law. In the fullness of time, God has his moments that he uses pre precipitously to make things happen. I think that's one of these. Suddenly you have this interest in publishing the Bible so people can read it. And you have the mechanism come together where it can be published so people can read it. Now people can read it for themselves in a way no one else could before. Tyndall had his successor. The Cloverdale Bible was one of those, as was uh, Matthew's Bible that uh, they were additions based on what he had already done. But more and more were being put out in various places. There was the Great Bible. They call it the Great Bible because it's big. It's the first Bible been used in, uh, in, in churches. And uh, it stood at the big front of the church, and it was in English, and the first time you could read English in church was because of the Great Bible. Um, and it was it was one of those things. Years ago, you're old, you've been around Waterview long enough, and I have you may have to go back fifty years ago. But I remember on Sunday night in the auditorium on the communion table. We obviously didn't have communion, and so uh, when we had scripture reading, we had an interesting thing. Um, we had a Bible. I'll, if I'd have gotten here in time today, I'd take a picture. You can, if you want to see it, take a trip behind the pulpit. Uh, it's always bothering me to keep the Bible under the pulpit. There's something symbolic about that. But that mm -hmm. That's important. But we have we had this Bible. It's, it's a Bible. It's, and Bill Gallagher had had made a beautiful wooden standing with it. And we had a spotlight. Spotlight's still there, but it wasn't. Spotlight. Turn that spotlight, that spotlight, that Bible. The reader will go up and take that Bible and spin it back around where he could read it. He would read it and at the end he'd spin it back around where he could see. I gotta tell you, I'm 68 years old, I still remember that. I can't tell you what the scripture reading last week was. But I can remember those. Why? The majesty of something. And that was exactly what they did there. The Great Bible took its place. The Geneva Bible, which was put out in 1560, it did one thing that uh, no other Bible had done before. It had illustrations and notes. It was the what I would call the first study Bible. You know, study Bible. That's the things that we'll get with all these notes. And, everything. and if you're in a Bible class, somebody says, well, my note says, like that scripture, yeah, uh huh. you know, I don't know what, whether AI put that out or somebody didn't know anything. A lot of them were wrong, by the way. So, but this was the first study Bible. It had notes, it had pictures, it tried to explain things, it had, had commentary that went with it, and people loved it because suddenly they understood what, uh, what the tabernacle looked like. They had at least a raw conception of what Noah's Ark, by the way, their Noah's Ark was her bottom boat, like I grew up with in, in Bible class. It wasn't Kurt Bottom Bow though. Um, but she just make it made the story go better for preschool. 
Um, but that's what they had. They also did several other things. They printed chapters and verse numbers, and they put in words that were that were not original in italics. Let me show you what that means. Single verses. This is Isaiah 66. You notice there's a verse there, there's a verse there, there's a verse there. They all look exactly alike. You come over here to the New International Version, and it's put together in paragraph form. You didn't know where, the truth be told, the way this is done, you don't know where the thoughts go. They didn't even do it very well, I think. I can tell you two places. End of Acts chapter 7, Stephen is stoned. You know what the first verse of chapter 8 is? And Saul was there approving to his death. That goes with chapter 7. You go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. It goes with the three chapters before it, but it says, follow me as I follow Christ. That goes back to those other chapters. It doesn't belong in chapter 11. You know why they did it that way, don't you? They had a certain number of verses they read in church on Sunday, and that's where they needed to break it. A pathetic reason to do that, but that's what happened. Um, they also added words that are kind of necessary to understand. This is, again, chapter 66 of Isaiah. Look what it says. Where is, and is is italicized, where is the house that you built for me, and where is the place of my rest? The term is is not there in the original language. They supplied it, because that makes good English, proper English. You come down, and it says, for all those things, it really read, for all those half my hand made. They said, you kind of need to know what the those are. I think they must have had an English teacher that went to church there. Uh, and I like this one here. He that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine blood. They tried to make that sound more appealing. And so when you, if you have a Bible today that uh, has those kinds of things, italics, it doesn't mean they are more important. And we always say italics mean those are the important things. No, they're not. Those are the things that don't belong there, but we have to have them to understand it. The other thing they did was they put the words of Christ in red. Those are holier, so you put them in different color. Uh, never quite understood that. And then there came what's called the breaches Bible. I say breaches because they weren't from the South. We don't have breaches. We say, if you don't cut that out, I'm going to warm your breaches. If you need a translation, for King's English, riches is how we say it. Because in, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7, it says that Adam and Eve sowed fig, and I notice how they spell fig, fig tree leaves together and made for themselves breeches. They made themselves some pants. Can you imagine how that sermon went? They got their sewing, singer sewing machine out, they made them some pants. That's kind of what that says. The breaches Bibles are what they called, and that's where it came from. Um, but this was these were the Bibles of the Pilgrims and the Puritans when they came to America at, at Plymouth Rock and other places. This was the, the Bible that Shakespeare would have used to, to perfect his English craft, and that would add another layer of dimension later. But this is what they would use on a regular basis, and then came the King James Version of 1611. King James assembled a group of people who, uh, a group of scholars at a place called Hampton Hill, called the Hampton Hill Conference in 1607. His goal was to deal with religious tolerance. After all, everybody wants to lead England because if you don't agree with the Church of England, we'll, we'll kill you. Nobody wants to stay in an oppressive environment like that. And so that's why all these people are willing to risk death crossing the ocean to do it. Uh, and, but all these scholars got together, and one of them was a guy named James Reynolds. And James Reynolds said, I think what we need is a new translation of the Bible. 
one that people can read, that they can understand, and, and find out for themselves what God has to say. Well, to James is great credit. He thought that was a great idea. May have been the only thing he thought was a great idea in his whole life. The rest of his reign was just pathetic. But this was the best thing that came out of it. But he gave them a rule. Here's the rule he said. I don't want any notes of comment except what is essential in translating the text. Don't make a study Bible out of it. Put only what's there and not what's not there. And several things were to a place with that. First of all, it's based on the Greek text of Erasmus, which is called the Textus Receptus, or the Received Text. Uh, we mentioned this before. I'll bring it back here again. Erasmus was a great scholar with a huge ego, and his text was as good as it got for the 1600s. They had not found the oldest and best manuscript yet, so he was using the best that he had, and then you had these critics who wanted to undo him, so they inserted words, and that's why in the King James Version, you get a different reading of First John chapter 5, 7, and 8. That was Erasmus. They did that. They used that as the basis of the text. And every other translation since that time, since the 1700s, has said the this is late and it's not found in any Greek manuscript before the 16th century. You start reading them and you know exactly when it came. Because you'll find it for you. Ever. Nowhere. So we know that John didn't write it. It was inserted, but we try to do that. Now, one of the things that happened is this page. I'll show you this page for a little bit. When I was growing up, we had, my mother had some dear friends in Stanton, Texas. In Stanton, Texas, Preston was the man of the family. He was a farmer. He was one of these guys. He had just brown, brown, leathery skin, but he had really white hair. He spent all day long on tractor. He was an elder of the church down in Stanton. When I got when I got in college, I did what every college kid do. I, I paraded my ignorance. Understand something about college kids. They think they know everything. They're dumber than dirt. I was. I thought I was tough stuff. I had I was going through Bible courses at Abilene Christian University. I knew this. I knew this. I had a lot of facts. I had all this stuff. I had two years of Greek, blah, 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 blah. I didn't know nothing. But I thought I knew everything. So one day, I don't know how we got on this subject. He, we started talking about translations of the Bible. And he said, oh, I don't want to use the King James Version of the Bible because that's the one that's authorized. I said, what? It's the only one that's authorized. I said, what do you mean? He said, it says it right there. It's authorized. He went and picked his Bible up off the shelf, and he showed me this page. And sure enough, right here, it says authorized. King James Version. You think God put that there? No, 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 no. That means that this hasn't been tampered with. It's approved by the, by the crown. But, you know, I've had people all my life say, the only one you can read, the only one God allows you to read is King James Version, because it's the only one authorized. Now today I just go, huh, that's interesting. I shake my head and go, you have a right to be wrong. I don't want to tell them that, but that's how I think. And so, but this is one of the problems. The good thing, this was a committee that put this together. There are two kinds of translations, and we'll talk about both of them next week. Committee and a, a, a solo individual. Wycliffe and Tyndall were solo individuals. This was a committee work. The good thing about a committee is a committee is slow and deliberate, while an individual uh, can be fast. But what they had to do, they had to work out different viewpoints of Scripture. They had to work out, what did this really say? And somebody said, I think it says this. And another said, no, I don't think it says that. And they had to hammer that out. And it makes for a much better text when people do that. And so this was a, a, a very distilled, very, very good. I'm not going to dismiss the fact. It was a very good translation. still is for a lot of reasons. One of the things they did, though, they had a... 
inlet. Now, the only way you can get this now is to pay $3.99 to Amazon to, down, to, to buy it. But it was called the Translators to the Reader. It gave their philosophy of why they were translating the Bible and how they did it. One of the things they put in that is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 29, verse 11, that says, read this, I pray. He was fain or joyous to make this answer. I cannot, for it is sealed. Is there a way of saying there was a time this was sealed away and you couldn't read it. And you wanted to read it, but you couldn't. But now read this because you can't. Not a bad instruction for people. Think about all the languages come out of King James Version. We use words today. Uh, there was a PBS uh, program back in the 80s, which they talked about the language of the Bible and how it came into modern use, how we use it today, things like journalism or law or regular conversation. They turned the world upside down. Or as a lamb led to the slaughter, or a thorn in the flesh. Somebody's hurting, well, I got my thorn in the flesh back. Uh, a still small voice, whole title of a book in a movie, East of Eden. That's what the King James Version did to society. It laden society with, with biblical language to still be used today. I, I'm always tickled when someone doesn't even believe the Bible and they use a word or a phrase that's biblical. Armageddon, for instance. We use the word Armageddon all the time. First time it was used was the King James Version. And so there it was. For its time, it was the most attested translation. It was the best that you could get. And it stayed that way until roughly 1900. It had lasting power. The next time it would be taken on would be the American Standard Version. And it wasn't, it was better textually worse linguistically. It made the Bible readable. You and I can read the Bible and understand it because it made the Bible readable. Are you aware that the Bible is not readable in the original languages? When Zechariah is summoned to the temple and he he's, cannot speak because his son has been born, John the Baptist, and they said, what will be his name? And they expected a family name. He says, a name to him is John. You don't read that. You read a name, his name will be John. It made it readable. A couple of takeaways from today's lesson. We're going to continue this next week some. We take for granted that we have Bible computers. Oh, yeah. We pull them off the shelves and put them back. I mean, they're everywhere. They, I don't know if they're still in hotel rooms or not, but, you know, it used to be you go to a hotel room, you go to a single, find a Bible. If we say to you today, take your Bibles and turn to the reason you have that. It's because of a lot of things that took place that we don't think about. But we also take for granted the price the people paid to give us that blessing. We have it not because it was easy, it was because it was hard and they paid with their lives. And there's a, a great debt of gratitude that we need to extend on a regular basis that somebody was willing to die so we could read God's word. So next week, we're going to tackle one more piece of this, which is you have all these translations, you go, I don't know what to read. Problem with choices, you have choices. And so you have maybe two dozen translations. Which one's the best one? How do we approach these choices we have in translations today? And we'll talk about that again next week. So.